This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Shapeshift.io, the easiest, fastest, and most secure way to swap your digital assets. Don't run the risk of leaving your funds on a centralized exchange. Visit Shapeshift.io to get started. Hello and welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. I'm here all by myself today. It's been a long time that I've done an episode by myself. I think it happened like once or twice before. But I'm here today with Adam Perlo and Ash of the Zen Protocol. And it's super interesting, crazy, and lots and lots of new ideas to project to build a decentralized financial system. So uh, Adam and Ash, thanks so much for joining me today. Hi, Brian. Thanks for taking the time to meet us. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so I, I, I spent quite a bit of time today, you know, kind of looking at what you guys are building, and it's, it's very interesting. I think there are a lot of, a lot of sort of key things that we have, um, a lot of key components of blockchains, how they work today. You guys are doing kind of differently, and it, it, it works out very interestingly. So there's going to be a lot of stuff to cover here, and I'm sure we won't get to everything, but uh, I look forward to that. But maybe before we get into Zen, um, Adam, can you share with us, like, how did you first get involved in Bitcoin and what has been kind of like your journey in this industry? So personally, I found out about Bitcoin in um, 2011. Um, at the time, a friend just showed me about this website and, you know, as he, he said, oh, you know, there's Silk Road. And I essentially saw, oh, well, that's really cool that you have Bitcoins there. Um, didn't go much on the site after that point, but I was very fascinated with the fact that there's a technology that could survive in such an environment. Um, and, you know, I researched it. I saw the economic aspects of it and I dived into it. Um, then in, essentially, I, I first started with trying to, you know, help build communities. I was one of the found, like, first people in the Israeli Bitcoin community. Then we essentially, maybe when I came, there were about another five people in Israel that knew about Bitcoin. After that, I was developing um, internally a wallet for essentially me and Nathan were building a wallet um, and another individual called Ellie that essentially was some sort of combination between change to Auger. Essentially, it was a one-click um, one -click social media uh, tipping and essentially entering, let's say, contracts. Uh, over Facebook, YouTube, and uh, whatever, Twitter. Then, essentially, after that, uh, we decided to uh, move on to Zen, and I can talk more about that uh, later. And what about you, Ash? So, I first heard about Bitcoin also in uh, 2011. Um, I suppose I've always uh, been very interested in technology. Um, Bitcoin was new and exciting then. Um, I didn't really touch Bitcoin for a long time, uh, not until I met Adam, actually. Um, I was in Israel um, working at a cybersecurity company, and a mutual friend introduced me to Adam and Nathan, and they told me about this idea they'd have, they'd had um, for Zen Protocol, we discussed this, we decided to go and do it together. Cool, interesting. Well, Adam, I, I'm curious, sort of on a high level, can you tell me, how do you look at blockchain? Like, what, what do you think is interesting about blockchain? Sure. So um, I think that what's interesting is it, that it's for the first time where essentially people have a way to assert and transfer ownership of things without needing to rely on, you know, some trusted third party. I think that's really the heart of it. Um, I think Bitcoin was like a goal and the blockchain was a mechanism to achieve that goal. Um, and I think, although this may sound very simplistic, I think that it's most obvious that, you know, the blockchain is going to excel at the goal that it was initially designed for. Okay. And, and now, so you mentioned in 2016, you guys started working on, or you started working on Zen Protocol. What, what's kind of the origin story of, of that and, and the vision that you guys came up with then? So personally, I was kind of, it's very funny, by ser serpent, serpentipity, I was somehow found myself you know, behind them, um, whether it was color, like somehow had a personal connection with color coins or a master coin, you know, even Ethereum. And I saw how all these projects um, came and, and went, or some of them are still ongoing. Um, and essentially, 
you know, Color Coins was motivated by this idea of let's move some asset around, but we don't want it just to be Bitcoins, right? Let's have more assets. And then you had MasterCoin that said, you know, the Bitcoin 2.0, the first, the first go round of this, uh, like new blockchain projects. And MasterCoin said, let's have more complex conditions. So essentially, you know, we want to have, let's say, um, let's say there's 20 or 30 different types of transactions you can do on MasterCoin. And Vitalik was working on that at the time. And he said, well, I, I do not have, I want to have more programmability. I don't want to be, have this restriction of just, you know, let's say 20 or 30 functions that I can do. Um, and I think that Ethereum went in that direction of, ena of enabling something very generalized and programmable, but essentially what I think that still the focus is, is you want really two things that Bitcoin doesn't provide. Um, I'm not talking about like adjectives, like more transactions per second or something. I mean, two like core things, which essentially, you know, support for multiple assets and ownership under uh, complex conditions. And we felt that none of these platforms are doing it correctly. Um, and then if you want to essentially facilitate a uh, financial system, uh, not just, you know, digital money, but actually have a bank in your pocket, you need to build something that, you know, is custom designed to do that. Um, and that was essentially the motivation that we saw, you know, we saw in 2016, after the DAO hack happened, we had this feeling that there was something like that could be done better for a while, uh, looking at Ethereum grow. But then after the DAO hack happened, we were, it was like confirmed. We said, okay, for sure we can do something better or not. It's not better with Ethereum. Like uh, each project has its own, its own things that it, it's good at, but for this specific use case of, let's say, owning your assets and transferring them under conditions that we felt that we could do something better. Um, and, and that's how essentially Zen, Zen came about. Okay, this is good. I, I like this definition, right? So you say, okay, decentralized financial system, you need basically, well, Bitcoin has, right, the money transfer, but then you need to be able to do it with multiple assets and you need to have like complex conditions. And of course, if you talk about complex conditions, you start talking about loans or derivatives and options, et cetera, et cetera, right? Yeah. Sure, many people would say, but you can do that on Ethereum, right? You, you can have multiple assets. You can write smart contracts to mirror basically any kind of derivative. So what, what makes Ethereum ill-suited for this? So I don't want to attack Ethereum in any way because I think that the, the design decision there is to enable a platform which, which is programmable and that allows people to try to innovate. And in order to be able to do that, you have to, you have to, Kind of say you know we're not going to specialize uh we're not going to do any one thing good in order to leave you know room air in the room for the other kind of like use cases let's say um now if you look at how ethereum came about by the way excuse me for my cold um but yeah so if you look at how ethereum came about um it was like first it was going to be you know more complex scripts on prime coin um and then it moved into its own thing and currently the architecture is such where you have like these these accounts and you have these externally owned accounts and internally owned accounts and that's how the whole thing um, works. But what, what people essentially really want to do is they don't want to have these dApps. They don't want to have a dApp that's acting like a token or a dApp that's acting like a contract and just like this sort of programmability in there. What I think they really want is, it, again, they want to own assets under some conditions um, and they want to reason about these assets in that way. And that's where, let's say with us, you know, we don't have um, an ERC-20. We actually have tokens. It's a distinct object. Even in Bitcoin, actually, it's like, it's just presumed because there's only one coin, right? That that the, the input and output is, is always Bitcoins. But with us, we actually, you know, each token has like an identifier and we have tokens as first-class citizens, as we call them. And then we have contracts and contracts you can think of um, very similar, like a pay to script hash in Bitcoin. Um, except with us, the you know the, the pay to script hash rather than being like a one-time use transaction that pay to script hash is essentially held in the active contract set so if you want to spend something locked to pay to script hash you have to be able to validate um it against a contract and the contract is a logic that will say okay you're allowed to release this under if you know these conditions are fulfilled okay so let's let's take a step back from here uh to pr provide some context for this so I think we, you know, you kind of described, I think, quite well, right? This this general idea of Zen as this uh, decentralized financial system, uh, and, and and you know, define kind of what those additional pieces are that are needed. So multiple tokens and the complex conditions. Is there anything else? Or is that that's in view of you? That's kind of the, the full thing. 
those are like let's say the um i'd say the, the the components of it but there's a lot of prerequisites i'd say in there as well so no one's going to be using this if there's unnecessary exposure to risk so you don't want to replace your banker with um, a contract that could essentially you know lose your money by mistake and you don't want to replace your banker with let's say being exposed to assets which are very volatile as a cryptocurrency maybe i'm just a normal individual you know i i just want to do my banking without a bank essentially but i don't i'm not even interested in you know bitcoin or ether or any sort of crypto token so this necessary exposure to to let's say a, a native token is something that that i think is going to hold is going to hold you know the current crypto systems back so one pre prerequisite is you know essentially security predictability of the outcome um, and then another one I'd say is actually being useful, doing something that actually makes a difference in people's lives. Um, that's essentially the whole motivation for us building an oracle mechanism because, you know, it's nice to have smart contracts and everything, but what are they worth if they can't, you know, operate on, let's say, um, interesting events? Um, and, and the final one I'd say is scalability. And the, I hate to say that because it's kind of like become like a, a meme already, uh, blockchain scalability. But but you do, we have seen with Bitcoin where, where it's at the point where if, if, if you don't take that in mind when designing the system initially, then, then it may make something bad may happen that may permanently change the course of, of you know, the outcome of that protocol. Okay, very good. So, so we have we had this, this additional kind of design requirements, the security thing. And of course, you mentioned the DAO incident before, and, and, and I think we see that continuously in Ethereum, the challenges of that. Uh, then the usefulness, and, and of course, uh, I think everybody or almost most people listening will, will understand the significance of oracles in that context, that you can basically have outside information so that some of these contracts or instruments can actually respond to events in the world. Um, and then scalability, of course, that's also a perennial topic. Great. Okay. That, I think that gives a good context. Now. It seems you guys are very inspired by Bitcoin and, and you built this in this kind of UTXO approach. Now, actually, maybe I, I think a lot of people will not be familiar with UTXO versus Ethereum's model. Can you explain just very briefly kind of like what is this UTXO approach? What is Ethereum's model and like why did you guys choose the Bitcoin way? Well, actually, since then, I think this is a great question to also have Ash um, come on and comment about that. Right. So um, I suppose I, I, I'd say the UTXO approach is um, much more simple, actually, than to have an accounts-based system. Um, you're envisioning um, tokens as something that can be spent and split into more tokens, and they are just representative of some kind of value. Um, you can split them, you can uh, consume them to make um, new ones of the same amount. Every transaction um, outputs the same amount that it was input. That's pretty much it, really. Uh, there's nothing more than that. You don't need to keep track of any kind of account balance. Um, you don't need to exchange anything through any kind of smart contract. Um, you're just locking something to a public key, saying, okay, this isn't mine anymore, now it's someone else's. The account space system in Ethereum is far more complex. Um, Probably the reason Ethereum ended up with an account system is because they decided they wanted to be able to do general purpose computation. So they designed Ethereum um, not to be a network that can uh, send around assets, but to actually function as a computer. So once you're functioning as a computer and you have the ability to store state, you might as well represent assets as just part of this state as entries in some database. So the account space system in Ethereum is probably not nearly as simple um, as a Bitcoin style system. Um, it's just that once you already have all of the complexity of maintaining uh, some kind of decentralized computer, you might as well go the extra mile and do accounts as well. Okay, maybe I can just sort of uh, like paraphrase that and, and let me see if I get this right. Because you guys say uh, as a sort of primitive unit in the system, right, is assets, right? So. Uh, you know, different types of assets, and then the other thing, right, the computation is kind of like associated with a particular asset and it manages like ownership of that asset, right? So kind of the asset stays as this like fundamental unit 
and like it is in Bitcoin, right? Well, the Bitcoin is the fundamental unit. So it's kind of natural to just extend that a bit. Whereas in Ethereum, right, because you general computation, you can do anything and contracts calling each other, there's no assets aren't a fundamental unit, right? Uh, so, so you get rid of assets and you kind of build it later in and of course you end up with a completely different architecture. Yeah, I think that's very um, accurate. I'd also say that um, one of the things that you could get around, um, maybe quantum is trying to do it right now, but essentially using a gas system, not knowing what the transaction fee is ahead of time, kind of would require an accounts approach. I find it very hard to, how would you, how would you do UTXOs if you don't know what the transaction fee you're offering is ahead of time? Um, so I think that's kind of like a design requirement on Ethereum side. Okay, okay. So this is now, again, to kind of rephrase this. So, of course, in Ethereum, right, we have this system like, okay, people sending computation, I mean, the network doesn't necessarily know how long it's going to take, right? So they have to send along with it basically money or, and then uh, that gets paid to miners depending on how much computational steps it takes. And, of course, in Bitcoin, uh, it's just paid based on the size of the transaction. And then I guess in Ethereum, right, the size of the transaction doesn't really tell you anything about the computational complexity. And, and so with you guys, I guess you have a similar thing, right? Where the size of a transaction isn't uh, a good indicator of how much work it is gonna be to execute that transaction. Is that correct, right? So with us, actually, that's our, I'd say, main scientific contribution that Ash has done, which changes that up, I wanna, yeah. Yeah, so um, in Ethereum, uh, because you want to be able to do any kind of computation, uh, they designed th uh, they designed Ethereum to be able to support this by having this uh, gas system, where you tell the uh, Ethereum virtual machine to do all of these instructions, and each time it it uh, looks at the instruction, it looks up the gas price for that instruction, it looks up um, how much gas you've paid for. Um, if you have enough gas to cover that instruction then it subtracts, it subtracts the gas from the gas you paid for, it then executes the instruction and it proceeds in this loop. Now, this model of uh, giving the virtual machine a load of instructions um, is part of Ethereum's architecture of uh, being a computer. They did, uh, wanted to make it operate at the lowest level possible to give it the greatest possible generality. Um, we saw with incidents like uh, the DAO and the parity multisig, um, what, what hacks, having a very low level system doesn't necessarily make your system very secure. And if you want to be doing any kind of decentralized finance, you need to be able to inspire a large, a high degree of uh, trust within smart contracts. So we looked at what we could be doing um, to give uh, greater security guarantees in smart contracts. We're interested in language-based security. So instead of going with the absolute lowest level language, because it's the simplest, we decided actually we're going to go with something extremely high level. And it turns out when you have extremely high level languages, um, you can actually use them to express things like their own um, resource costs, which is very unusual. Um, probably very few people outside of academia would ever have seen this done. Um, but we've kind of brought this into the real world somewhat. Um, so we're having smart contracts that um, must express their own resource cost, uh, which can then be quickly verified. So because we know the resource cost of any contract, which can be parameterized by um, inputs or whatever you want, it doesn't have to be fixed, but there has to be some expression that you can give for it. Since you know how long a contract is going to take to run before you run it, you don't have to do all that uh, keeping track of gas. Essentially, essentially, let me just add, the way I see it is that, you know, yeah, in order to, to enable like um, loops and recursion, Ethereum, the only way to do it is by implementing this, putting everything under this like virtual machine umbrella and having this counter in there. Um, and I think that we're probably the only system that both allows you to do um, recursion on arbitrary inputs while at the same time not requiring this sort of counter or virtual machine to do that. 
Um, and that's all this F star formal verification stuff Ash has been talking about. Okay, uh, that sounds cool, right? So, so I get that in Ethereum, right, it's kind of complex because you send uh, your contract in there or your transaction in there, it's gonna result in some computation, you have to send money along with it so it has enough for that computation. You don't know exactly how much or maybe, or, or the network at least doesn't know when that transaction comes, how much it's gonna be and uh, and of course, if you can, if I can prove, okay, this is going to be this many steps, I can send exactly that amount, pay for exactly the transaction, so I don't have, we don't have gas anymore. That sounds good. Is that such a huge deal? Like, why is it so great to get rid of gas? So, it's not that, I mean, beyond, um, I think Ash previously pointed out, let's say those, you know, four acts four times as much steps just to like kind of monitor the gas. Um, it's beyond that. It's like, I think it's the, the gas is pushing the requirement for this virtual machine rather than the other way around. Um, once you, once you can get rid of gas, then you can, you can start treat, you can treat a contract as its own independent object. You don't need to like uh, look at a contract as part of the greater thing, because think of it, if you have no way of determining the price of executing the contract, then the only way that you can be able to deal with it as a miner is by using this virtual machine. But with us, since you don't need the gas and you don't need the virtual machine, you can evaluate each of these contracts on its own. Um, not to confuse the viewers, but that's like essentially what our analogy for, let's say, maybe a virtual machine, although very different, is our like active contract set. So the set of contracts that can currently operate but you can view each of these contracts as its own independent computer. Um, now, and the benefit of this is essentially a few things. Not only do we have language-based security, um, which is the whole form of verification and that kind of stuff. It's also, I don't even know how to call it, architecture-based security. So let's take the recent bug that you had where someone essentially deleted, you know, committed suicide on an Ether account. Uh, and that Ether account was used to validate a, a multi-sig contract. Now, because of this paradigm where you have a virtual machine and one thing calls the other to get things, rather than like these independent components, independent, not even come with like each independent contract, um, you didn't have built in, let's say, a good mechanism by which um, you could like reactivate that contract, revive that contract, and a lot of money was lost. So this idea of having this isolation and this idea of this isolation and independent evaluation enables you to to essentially enables a lot more scalability because it's not a single threaded process anymore. It's like a multi-threaded process. It's like running a, a GPU rather than a CPU. You can think of it that way. You can, each of our contract can run in parallel and they can run in compiled version because they can run compiled. Um, that's also a lot faster. So we don't interpret things with, with us essentially, once you activate a contract, miners take its code, um, they extract the F star into essentially native like machine code they, com they compile it to that. And then uh, whenever you're doing an operation with, that depends on one of these contracts, it just you know runs super quick at the machine code level, essentially. Okay, I think I sort of get it. Given that you don't know the cost, you must have gas. And given that you have gas, you can't essentially compile the code in the contracts natively. You're, you're forced to interpret it if you don't know the gas cost. You're forced to go along one instruction at a time um, keeping track of the gas cost for every instruction. Every instruction, you're looking up its gas price, you're seeing if the user has enough gas, you're subtracting it and going on to the next instruction. Uh, why couldn't you compile it and have gas? Because you have to be doing this interpretation one by one of these instructions. You're not necessarily going through these instructions, you want to be able to stop when you run out of gas. Right, right. I mean, I, I guess I could imagine, let's say I've run the contract before, then maybe you could compile it and somebody sends it to you and you already know how many, much gas it costs. Well, no, you, you only know how much gas it's going to use if it's given the exact same input in the exact same state. Yeah, but okay. You're not, yeah. you're not invoking it every time with the exact same input and the exact same state. So you have no way of knowing. Yeah, okay. No, I, I mean, that sounds, uh, that sounds great. And of course, the whole formal verification thing, right, is also something that has been uh, much talked about. I think mainly in the context of uh, security, right? Uh, but that's also very interesting. I think these kind of other simplifications that come along with it. I want to note that this isn't theoretical also. Um, 
I, I encourage your viewers to go right now to alpha.zenprotocol.com. Um, it's not a concept. It's like we, we actually have something working. So, um, yeah, let's let's see. Let's see if we're right. Let's see if it breaks. Yeah. So the, what I found interesting reading through your guys' material is this this UTXO approach. And, and of course, what actually it reminded me of a lot was uh, Corda by R3, right, which is also very, very Bitcoin inspired. And it also has this kind of like modular thing where things are kind of their own entities and get like executed and they can have their own like kind of verifiers or little consensus processes as opposed to having like one big global system. Uh, do you also see a lot of parallels to Corda? Personally, um, I got to say, although we just talked about it right before the show, the last I remember looking at Corda was a few years ago. It's been a while until I really took an in-depth look at it. Um, and essentially, you know, my current went right. And I think he, he had maybe a lot of input on the design. So maybe that's why they went with Bitcoin. Um, I'd say I'd say it's probably a lot, a lot very similar because then they, they um, they're a blockchain built for finance and we're a blockchain built for finance. The difference is just that, you know, one of them is for selling it to banks and we're, you know, for giving people more freedom. So... Yeah, they, they may very well be have a lot of similarity there, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, of course, that is the big difference, right? Is that this is uh, meant to be a public, ne or this is a public network, and, and Corda is uh, a permission network, uh, I think. But yeah, I mean, the, the I'm, not, I'm not, I don't understand Corda that well. You know, we did, uh, I guess, a podcast about it with, with Mike and Richard once upon a time, and I kind of read about it and stuff, but... Um, but it sounds very similar. I think a lot of things are similar and I haven't seen that elsewhere. Right? I, I don't think I've ever seen another project that kind of went a similar direction. The UTXO, you mean? Yeah, this, yeah, this kind of UTXO smart contract mix. I think it's a lot you know, simpler for a developer to reason maybe about accounts initially, right? Maybe you need, want to abstract that stuff away. Maybe you want to have a tools like an SDK where the developer is thinking um, in terms of a wallet, rather than in terms of which, you know, UTXO is he going to spend right now. That I'm very empathetic to. I guess the thing is, like, imagine that for a second that you were as a node or as a user, you were like partitioned from the Bitcoin network. So, um, you know, like, a UTXO is in itself like a cryptographic thing of, uh, it's like a cryptographic object of importance. And you know it's yours. You don't know if it's been spent or not, but you still have something. Whereas with the account system, it's like you kind of need everything or you have nothing. Um, so it's like, it's a very, it's, it's a minute difference, but yet it can be important. Um, so yeah, I think I think that in general, it, it enables a lot of things at a technical level, but at a usability level, you know, people shouldn't be thinking about UTXOs maybe. This episode is brought to you by Shapeshift, the world's leading trustless digital asset exchange. Quickly swap between dozens of Leading cryptocurrencies including Bitcoin, Ether, Zcash, Gnosis, Monero, Golem, Augur, and so many more. When you go to shapeshift.io, you simply select your currency pair, give them your receiving address, send the coins, and boom. Shapeshift is not your traditional cryptocurrency exchange. You don't need to create an account. You don't need to give them your personal information and they don't hold your coins. So you are never at risk from a hacker or other malicious actor. Shapeshift has competitive rates and is even integrated in some of your favorite wallet apps like Jax. So you can swap your digital assets directly within your wallet just as easily as putting on your slippers. Whenever you see that good looking fox, you know that's where Shapeshift is. So to get started, visit shapeshift.io and start trading. And we'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter. Well, let's speak about this active contract set. Can you explain how that works? So the idea is you see this huge growth in, in state space uh, in Ethereum. Um, and, and that makes sense. It's not a criticism, uh, like the legitimate, but essentially the idea here is to say, well, why do we need these contracts? They just sit around there. Um, and actually maybe Ethereum was kind of thinking like, let's have them commit suicide, right? We have two, two types of contracts. We have active contracts and inactive contracts. Now an inactive contract can only receive funds. And the identifier of the inactive contract is the hash of its code. So it doesn't have, that contract doesn't have state. 
directly. Um, it just has code that stays fixed. You take a hash of that code, and that's your contract identifier. And you can always send tokens to a contract. However, releasing tokens from that contract, send, sending funds from a contract, or using a contract to issue new tokens, that's a, a step that requires activation. Because um, say, for example, I lock up funds in a contract. Well, now we need the miner, and then I say, okay, I want to unlock the funds. How does the miner know whether he should listen to me or not? The only way the miner knows is by storing that contract code. And essentially, the active contract set is the area, um, it's the, the group of contracts, which right now people are paying the miners to store. Um, so essentially, if a contract is active, you can spend funds locked to it, and miners have to store active contracts. And they get rid of the contract once it runs out of the activation fee. Okay, so so I, I think on a, on a high level, right, that kind of makes sense, right? So I'm, I'm putting in this contract, right? Of course, it's, it creates a burden on the miners and on the network, right? So I pay for the time that it lives there, right? Not like in Ethereum where I put in this contract, I pay once, it's there forever. So that that I understand. But then let's say there's a bunch of assets in there and and this runs out right out of money and you said okay but somebody can reactivate it but then how can you reactivate it if the miner kind of like throws away it doesn't have it anymore like how does that work sure so let's say um and maybe we'll use this example again let's say we're talking about uh i'm writing a call option so a call option essentially says you're going to pay me money today um for the event that let's say in a month from now if um, the price goes above what we call a strike price. So if the price of the asset, uh, the stock goes above a strike price, then I owe you the difference between the strike and the appreciation of that asset. Um, people uh, essentially use call options when they're bullish in the short term, when they think an asset is going to go up in the short term and they want to essentially, you know, capture their gains and they, they don't want to be exposed to any downside. Uh, it's also a hedging tool. So essentially, let's say I'm going to write you a call option on Apple. We're going to look at it again in 30 days. So I'm going to create that contract. I'm going to, for step A is going to be writing the contract code, creating the contract, you know, identifier, which is done automatically. And bam, that's step one, right? You read that contract and you make sure that it's a legitimate contract. that's not trying to steal any funds from you. You know that, you know, if the price of Apple goes above, let's say $200, um, it, within the next 30 days, then you're going to be able to essentially take the funds back. So, after I wrote the contract, I, I'm going to then um, activate it. Now, once I activate it, I essentially, what I'm going to do is I'm going to attach an activation fee. Let's just call it what we call the contract sacrifice. And let's say I'm going to provide a contract sacrifice for two blocks. And by the way, um, I should note that while we, we have a different sorts of fees, so we have computation fees, which are just like for the, the cost of time, and we have um, the, the active contracts at fees, which are just like storage fees. So um, let's say I'm going to pay whatever what it costs to activate for two blocks. And within that two blocks, you know, we're going to activate the contract. And then, I'm sorry, and then I'm going to send collateral to it. And then that contract will issue me, um, like the, I'll, it'll issue me the, the writer's token. So I'm going to hold a token now of the person who just wrote a call option. Then you're going to come in. You're going to uh, pay the premium, right? Uh, let's say it's five bucks. Um, you're going to pay that premium. And then you're gonna, that contract will issue you a token saying, um, you know, if Apple goes up then and you have this token, then you can get the, the spread out. And after that operation has been done, after we each have the tokens that entitle us to our rights, that contract, it, it goes inactive. Now, both of us have a vested interest to keep this contract in our local computer, in our local memory, right? In the event, you know, wh whoever like wins, they need to get their money out. Now, Let's say for all intents and purposes, for the next 29 days, um, nothing interesting has happened. The price of Apple hasn't risen above 200. That contract just sits there inactive. But in the meantime, me and you can trade these tokens, right? So we can trade these tokens irregardless of the contract and irregardless of the collateral that that contract holds. So we're just moving these tokens around uh, at, you know, at free will and no one cares about what's going on in the contract. It's only at the, like, at the end of the position in our example where all of a sudden Apple jumps above 200, that then you say, okay, I'm gonna activate this contract and remove my collateral. Um, and then essentially what you're gonna do is you're gonna retake the code, you're gonna you know, 
put it back in the active set, it'll activate for a couple blocks, it'll take out your money, and that's going to be it. Yeah, this is amazing. Uh, I, yeah, I understood that, but maybe we just, maybe we just walk through it again, because uh, I think this is like a really key thing here. But it's okay, so we, we have the, the call option first, right, which uh, I guess the exact substance doesn't matter so much, but it's basically like a contract that, you know, means that uh, I pay something for a right, and then if the share price is at a certain point, I, I can make money. And if it isn't there, then it's just worthless to me. Uh, so so you, you create this option, right? So this option, creating this option means you basically create a bunch of smart contract code, you deploy it on a network, and you pay for it to live there for some time, right? This is a storage fee. Now, in this case, right, even though this option would only become its due date. Expiry. It's a, yeah, it's expiry date is like a month later, you're actually only paying for storage for like, I don't know, an hour or something like that, right? Because that, that is the window of time that then I can come in and say, uh, I'm going to take the other side of this. Uh, I'm going to also, you know, put in some collateral. So we both have some collateral in there. Uh, you get a token, I also get a token, right? So we both have a token that basically represents the opposite side of this trade. Then this contract goes like dormant. So the miners throw it away. But we keep it locally, right? We keep that contract code. Now, the, 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 uh, we can trade the token. I presume if you trade the token, right, you'd also, like, let's say we sold it to a third party, you'd have to send them along with it the contract code. But, you know, let's say we can trade this token, Apple shares change in price, so the tokens change in value. Uh, and then after a month, you know, let's say I, I was right, the Apple share went away, I fought, so my option is now worth a whole bunch of money. So I can... I can basically say I'm going to pay or I, I'm going to send back this code on the chain. I'm going to pay uh, this activation fee again and I pay to, to execute it and to basically get my money there. So the contract only really is there exactly when it needs to be there and is paid for exactly then. But at the same time, you can still trade that value the entire time. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what's going on. And and I guess let me I guess the implication of that too. I remember reading that somewhere, but I didn't fully understand it. But I think now I I understand it. I I guess this also means that uh, now let's say you like my option is worth you know I'd get from you a hundred dollars at this point. Uh, so I can go on the chain right, pay for that uh, activation fee, pay for the computation fee. And then I get my money, but of course I pay those fees. Whereas, could you also do it that basically you pay me out of band, and now I don't, like maybe now it's not possible for me to claim anything anymore. Yeah. Does yeah, that work yeah, yeah. as well, so that you don't actually have to execute it on chain? But yeah, that's, that's a great intuition. So that's, exact, that's exactly um, something that I find to be very attractive. Essentially saying, you know, we're gonna we're gonna view these contracts as like um, an enforcement mechanism more than the actual payment. Um, and maybe I have these like outstanding debts, and I'm I'm entering all these sort of deals. And the reason that you know maybe I'm doing a hundred deals a day, but I'll only have like a contract with collateral for let's say ten of those deals, and I can be proving you know that I you know someone entered a position, I paid them what I needed to pay, and I can prove that you know I've I've made these transactions. Um, it, yeah, that I've essentially made these transactions and pay you, like you said, out of band. So you bought the you bought the option, right? And then you know you won, and you you sent this request, you sent this token to me, and then after you get, sent me the token back, I'm gonna you know send you money. Um, now what what you could do essentially is you could come to the contract and say, hey, you know, I can show that um, I sent out of the token, but he didn't send me the money, right? Now now I need to get my money plus a penalty, for example. Yeah, yeah. No, this is uh, very interesting. I, I think uh, very just unusual. I, I, I really like how it's, it's different from 
from blockchain, other blockchain architectures that I've kind of seen. And yeah, so I guess with this multi-token multi approach, there's no assets, just get basically, um, yeah, treated the same way, it makes sense. So there is, of course, this native token, Zen, and now that doesn't get treated exactly the same way, right? Because that is what you use to pay for, is it the storage fee is just paid in Zen, was that right? No, in general, right? The way I view it is that why, why have another token? The token essentially does two things. Um, obviously, first is it's, it acts as a, you know, an economic subsidy, both for development today and you know, miners in the future. Um, so, so and, or other people in the future, um, essentially. So it acts as an economic subsidy. And the second thing is it acts as a focal point. So coming in and saying, okay, we're all going to accept, you know, this one thing and agree that, you know, this should be used for certain operations. So some operations could be, for example, voting, saying, you know, we want to we wanna vote on, on what happens. And the other operation, for example, could be when you have a sensitive, when you have a sensitive scenario, like the contract sacrifice. So when I'm inserting a contract in the active contract set, um, any miner can decide to activate that contract, but that contract is going to be sitting there, you know, active maybe for another hundred blocks. And he's not the one bearing that externality. He's not the one bearing that cost of storage. So um, when I make the contract sacrifice, that contract sacrifice is essentially split up among all the miners. And we need to make sure that they're paid the contract sacrifice in a valuable token. Because, in, for example, compare this with a transaction fee. Well, in a transaction fee, if a miner wants to waste his time by, you know, mining a worthless transaction, well, then that's, you know, whatever, his prerogative, right? He's, he's found the proof of work and he can waste, he can, he can take transaction fees, which are essentially useless. But when he's creating essentially bloat on the system, we need to ensure that, that um, the thing that's being made a payment in is, will have some value. So, yeah, so that's the only difference between setting the other yeah. tokens. But there's no, there's no real difference, just to make my point, sorry. Right, right. Because if, if a miner executes the computation, then it's just them and others don't have, don't have to actually execute it. Is that right? Everyone, everyone has to uh, do validation, but essentially, yeah, people, people go ahead and they do validation, but they're not like, they're, it's easier to, let's say, place a limit on validation, just like in Bitcoin, um, you have, you know, size val uh, limit, like one megabyte, but there's also like some sig hash, you know, limits um, on certain operations. And the same thing can happen here. We're going to say, okay, you know, there's, there's limitations on the amount of computation a miner can do, but the, the amount of time you can activate a contract for, um, you know, that's, that's justifiably limitless. I mean, I, I guess maybe I would phrase it like that, is, is that if you have a miner, right? So then they, they have an incentive to optimize what they actually execute, right? Because they keep those fees, right? So they want to choose something valuable. They don't want to choose something useless. Uh, but if it's, um, if it's the, the activation, right? Or the, where maybe it's for many, many periods going to be used and socialized, I guess, then it, it doesn't, it, it creates this kind of tragedy of the commons problem, maybe? Yeah, tragedy of the commons and also the ability to just easily attack the system. Because let's say we're counting, you know, just points. And one point has, you know, the value of a thousand X and the other point has a value of one X. Um, if we're just counting it on a, on a purely like absolute mechanism, without taking into account like, um, you know, the rates that these things are going for, then it would be very easy for someone to pay um, in the cheap points than in the expensive ones, right? Okay, yeah. Well, let's, let's move to the next thing. Let's speak a little bit about uh, Bitcoin integration because you guys have some interesting and weird kind of connection to the Bitcoin system. Can you explain how that works? Sure. So. The idea here is, you know, Zen was always wanting to come in as like sort of a side chain, um, not a, not exactly a side chain, but essentially as providing help to Bitcoin in some manner. So saying we're, you know, we're we're essentially we're not trying to compete with Bitcoin. We're providing complementary complementary services to it. Um, you know, having other tokens and that kind of stuff is actually something useful um, sometimes. 
Um, and the way that you know we're doing Bitcoin integration is essentially the Zen miners, they're running a, they're mining those Zen blocks, but they're running a Bitcoin node. Um, and while they're running this Bitcoin node, what they're being forced to do is they're forced to take um, the state of the Bitcoin network essentially and commit it in the Zen block. So when a Zen miner finds a Zen block, not only is he ordering all the transactions in the block, he's also taking the state that he's like reporting to what he thinks happened in the Bitcoin network. Um, and other miners will reject his block if they think that, you know, he lied about what happened in Bitcoin. This property essentially allows you to, um, it, it, it allows other people to essentially use Bitcoin transactions as an argument for smart contracts. So I can, for example, in our call option, like example, I can write a, a smart contract that says, um, you can pay me the premium to my Bitcoin address, for example. Um, yeah, so, so the Bitcoin integration, it, it, it essentially enables, you know, the interaction. For example, you could also even imagine back in the day, like you had Satoshi Dice. So you can imagine that people, you know, since it's a very quick transaction, you send, they send back, um, that Satoshi Dice would have like a small basket of collateral sitting there, making sure that, you know, everyone can trust them while all these transactions are going on. So let, let, let's just uh, do this thing of, okay, so we have this call option uh, on Zen and and now we want to have, or, you know, we have this financial instrument on Zen, but now we want to have a Bitcoin payment on the Bitcoin chain that let's say, uh, you know, for payment that I owe or something like that. And, and, and okay, I, we, I get that basically the headers of the Bitcoin chain are kind of written into, into the Zen chain. So I, I guess that means you can, so would it work like this? Uh, you send me some Bitcoins, uh, because the Bitcoin headers are in the Zen chain, you can basically kind of provide like an SPV proof on the Zen chain, the proof that you actually paid that Bitcoin and then the Zen protocol understands that. Is that how it works? Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Amazing. Pretty late, but let's, let's briefly speak about oracles at least. Yeah. W w what's the role of oracles? So essentially, essentially the oracles, you know, are, are like not built into the protocol, but they're still a very necessary component to have. Um, and you know, we, we, uh, we provided the first ones, um, but essentially the, the way that we're doing it is we're saying, listen, many of the assumptions made in previous Oracle mechanisms were saying, maybe someone wants to ask any question. Um, but essentially it's like a pull mechanism in other Oracles. So essentially, um, you know, the, the smart contract and Ethereum smart contract would ask the Oracle for some data and then the Oracle would go and provide that data. With us, it's, it's more of a push mechanism. So kind of what happens here is the Oracle is taking, taking the state of all the data sets that it believes that uh, someone may be interested in. So um, stock prices, you know, weather info, um, whatever, flight cancellations, all this kind of stuff. And he's sorting that into a Merkle tree and he's committing to this Merkle tree every block. Now, what that enables is then, right, it's very cheap to make the commitment and um, and he can also charge for payment. So when he's writing, when he's doing this Merkle tree, he's like salting these leaves. So he's creating this sort of secret that you need to have in order to be able to prove uh, what the price was. And so then what the Oracle does is, you know, he just, he goes about his daily business. He doesn't, he, there's no like com complexity really here. He's just, you know, gathering data from many APIs and doing this like continuous process very methodol methodological and <clears throat> in the event that is needed, in the event that let's say I default on a contract, how do you prove what the price of Apple was, right? So what you're gonna do is you're gonna go, you're gonna pay that Oracle, you're gonna say, listen, um, please provide me with the path and the secret that essentially will enable me to prove to the smart contract what the price of Apple is at the time. So me and you are gonna agree when we write the contract who the single Oracle or set of Oracles will be um, in the event one of them is down or one of them is malicious or whatever, but we're going to agree on, let's say a set of five oracles, right? And, and essentially, um, you know, most of the time we're going to settle without the oracle, but in the event that we need to settle, it's not even the contract talking to the oracle. You'll just go, you'll ping the oracle. You'll say, Hey man, I need, I need to have this, this proof. He'll provide you the proof and then you can use that proof in the contract. And that's how the contract works. The oracles work. I mean, one of the things I found interesting about this, I, I think you, you mentioned that somewhere in the paper or something, 
is the regulatory aspect of that, right? Because an oracle, of course, can be, like let's say an oracle writes to a contract on Ethereum, and that contract is then some financial instrument. Uh, well, that can be kind of tricky, right? Because all of a sudden it's like, okay, but this is a regulated activity, et cetera. Whereas here, basically, it's almost like the Oracle is just a cryptographic data feed. It's kind of like writing that into the chain and then it has to be queried and, and it, it just provides his answer. And that can then be used to execute whatever contract on Zen without the Oracle actually being involved there. Exactly, exactly. So for example, let's say maybe um, uh, one thing that may be totally legitimate in a country, maybe, you know, a normal, a normal stock, right, or a normal CFD, let's say, but then that same country may ha have a ban on, you know, highly leveraged binary options. Um, but the Oracle, as far as the Oracle is concerned, he, he, he doesn't know. He's just reporting the price of Apple. Okay, well, let's, let's speak now about a, another, another complex topic. So the consensus algorithm. So you guys have this also, again, like unusual thing that I haven't seen anywhere else, which is basically that you have these hashing algorithms like in Bitcoin, and, but except that there are several different ones. And then one uses the tokens to basically vote on the difficulty for the different algorithms. So basically saying, okay, I mean, I, so, so you have so, almost like a consensus process to manage the proof of work algorithm. Like, why? It seems, it seems a very like uh, strange. Why would you do that? Yeah, why would you do that? So the motivation, actually this was first published to the Bitcoin mailing list. I think it was like in March before the whole fork thing happened. And essentially we recognize that there's this issue of contention here. You know, let's say maybe users aren't satisfied that, that you know, miners are are acting in certain ways. And not only in the ways that have been recently, you know, on social media all over. Um, maybe, you know, it's not okay to, to SPV mine or to, maybe even pools aren't okay with users. It doesn't matter what, what the case is, but essentially users have no credible threat against these miners. So they can say, we don't like it, we don't like it, we don't like it. But it, there's not a very high chance that users are gonna, let's say, um, hard fork and change a proof of work because you know, obviously those coin holders would be hurting themselves very much in the process of doing this. So this creates this kind of like cold war dynamic where no one can make the first move. Um, also on a kind of a separate side note, but it mixes into this is the fact that, you know, um, when, when Bitcoin started, right, the idea was that hash power would be the votes, one CPU, one vote. And then I guess everyone kind of agrees that maybe hash power um, wasn't isn't like dispersed in a way that it's the optimal way to make decisions in Bitcoin. So we're not saying, okay, we'll just let hash power decide, but there is no like good governance mechanism. If hash power isn't deciding what is people who yell the loudest on social media, that's not necessarily a good idea. And because it wasn't substantiated at the first point, even when they hold um, coin votes, which I think they did, I don't want to get into the whole argument, but I think they did on, you know, Bitcoin.com's website, they had a coin voting, right? Um, people didn't accept that because they said, well, you know, that's not the way the system was designed. It wasn't designed for coin, coin voting. So this, this whole mechanism is both a way to essentially say, number one, like coin voting is going to be like uh, the, the, essentially the way to make decisions going forward. And number two, we're going to also use coin voting as a way to enforce and incentivize uh, actions on behalf of the people who are servicing the network. So I view, we view kind of like miners as people who need to service the network. Um, and you know they need to be paid for it, and if they and if they don't listen, essentially they can lose the. the it, it's it's not like a it's it's not a god given privilege to be a miner in Zen, right? That can be taken away from you if you don't behave um, correctly, or at least taken away from everyone who owns your sort of hardware. Um, and and so this provides this sort of incentive um, to to behave correctly because you know that it's a credible threat that the users may may kind of you know provide you with less of. Um, with less of the mining reward, with less of the blocks. And they'll do that by increasing the difficulty for you relative to all the other miners out there, the other, the different hashing algorithms. Okay. I mean, I, I actually, I can sort of understand if one comes from the like proof of work, like paradigm to say, okay, this is an improvement, right? It like, it, 
uh, potentially, right? It potentially addresses some of the issues we've seen in Bitcoin. But it, it feels to me, I mean, you know, from sort of coming a little bit from the Cosmos, Tendermint, proof of stake inspired thinking, it feels to me it's going like, like halfway or partially, because okay, sure, coin voting governance makes sense, but then why not also use basically the coin weight for validation, and why not have like security deposits? Because there's so much, I, I mean, a whole, of course, a variety of benefits, right? Like this speed, scalability, all of that works better, but maybe one of the biggest one, right? At least with the Tendermint style thing, uh, is, is that blocks are final. And, and that seems to be a huge issue here. If you have forks, uh, you know, it, if you have forks and then you have to roll back these options or complex financial contracts, I mean, nobody's going to be able to deal with this. Yeah, um, I hear your point. Um, I think it's, it's kind of funny that, you know, we don't see many reorgs happening in Bitcoin, like not yeah, not let's say normal, oh, it was an accident kind of reorg. That that doesn't happen very often. Not for more than like a block or two, right? The, it's very rare to have like, you know, a reorg after 10 blocks. Um, so I think it's, it's relatively safe to, I don't see this as the biggest problem. And I also agree that, you know, maybe a lot of people are asking, you know, why, why, like why, why miners, right? And we, I kind of touched on this earlier personally. So the way I see it is that, there's been a huge divergence of what miners are supposed to be doing and maybe what they're currently doing. I don't think that they're just supposed to be saying they're maybe wasting hash power. They, they should be, you know, being a node and, and essentially servicing the network, you know, taking transactions, propagating them out, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the predominance of pools has essentially hurt that. And that's something that, you know, we may look at essentially fixing, um, saying that, you know, we're, we may... We're, we're still considering it. Um, I think we have a very good method of doing it, but essentially saying, you know, we're going to remove the ability to use a pool. We're just still going to going to going to make it co competitive. So we're going to provide this sort of smart contract that that enables you to to mine um, even even if you're not like a huge miner. So it's still competitive for for the little guy. But essentially, you know, remove the ability to use pools, thus forcing everyone to 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 run to run a node. Um, and I think that when you look at it this way, then you're saying, okay, I understand, you know, that hash power is a good proxy for essentially the computer existing, the guy's running a node, okay, I want to compensate him for running that node. Um, and, and when you look at it from that aspect, I view then the coin creation as a subsidy for being a network service provider, rather than like, rather than, uh, I don't know what coin holders at the networking level, at the hardware level, let's say, are really doing for the network topography. Essentially, does that make some sense? Well, yeah, but I mean, the coin holders, they, they could basically stake coins and then validate, right? And, and, and then let's say they get returned, but also if they, you know, if they don't do things right, they get punished. It seems to be, it, it seems, uh, I, I don't think it fully makes sense to me. Sure, you no, I'm, I'm happy to explain. So, so essentially, um, if you think of it, I'm not sure of all the different ones, no offense intended at all. Um, I think that essentially, you know, I, I looked at one of them, like with the delegated proof of stake. So one of the big things that makes it scalable is that people know which, which, which node is going to like find the next block, which person is going to find the next block. But because you know this, it means that there's not a very high incentive to, to, to propagate things very quickly and be highly connected to the network with proof of work. There's a big incentive because the, the the lower your latency is, the more bandwidth you have, the faster you validate, the quicker you process, the higher the probability of finding another block is. Um, and I think that this is very important when you're looking at like, what is the function we want miners to be doing beyond, you know, just securing the network with hash power. We also want them to be acting as nodes. Um, and that's why I think proof of work is, is part of the reason. Now, if we're looking at like the economics of it, right? that's a different discussion. So we have two discussions going on here, I think, about proof of stake. One is like the economic aspect and the other is the the technical aspects. Now on the economic aspect, I think that, you know, it can be done that the more coins you have, the higher probability it is to find another block. Um, the question is, you know, do we want to do that? Like, do people want to do that? I think that we should let people decide, but but essentially it may create a situation where people say, ah, this, 
this was a pre mine and you know I'm gonna go fork my own version. Um, so yeah, so I think that there's like that, that that's a different conversation. The economics of it, like you know, should we be mining or should we we be coin holding? But from the technical perspective, I I think that you know that that essentially there's there's some benefits to proof of work, and I'm not sure about the case of proof of stake. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, that's yeah. Pretty much that. Okay, great. Well, uh, guys, thanks so much. It was super fascinating. Now, of course, uh, well, no, not of course, but you, so you guys also have a, a token sale. Now, we're kind of at the end, we won't have much time to speak about it, but I'm sure some people will be interested and they want to like learn about it and read about it and the economics of it in terms and when it's happening, et cetera, et cetera. Can you share, uh, like where, where should people go? What are the dates when it's happening and how can people learn more about it? Sure. So, um, yeah, um, please go to www.zenprotocol.com. Um, all the information is there. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Oh, go, please try to use our software at alpha.zenprotocol.com. Um, and thank you very much for your time, Brian. Yeah, no, thanks so much, guys. And, and just briefly, so when is the when is this token sale starting and, and when is the ending so people know? Sure, it's um, starting on November 30th, ending December 30th, end of the year. Okay, great. So, so people know that. Okay, well, well, thanks so much. It was really, really fascinating. Uh, of course, we'll have links in the show notes to to write you for blog posts, light paper, and and there's a nice, uh, indeed, that, that kind of alpha demo that you guys have. Uh, it's very impressive. So I, I yeah, highly encourage people to check it out. And yeah, thanks so much, guys, for coming on. Thank you, man. And of course, thanks so much for listener for once again uh, tuning in. So if you want to support the show, you can do so by leaving us an iTunes review. And not a lot of people do it, but it helps new people find the show. So we do appreciate that. Uh, and yeah, we look forward to being back next week. Thanks so much.